Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause coming to you from two very distant locations, one right here in my television studio apartment in the wood of the holly under the sign. And then on the other side of this very slender digital divide coming to you from Rotterdam in the Netherlands is a very talented and multi, uh, just a talented person across many, many uh, areas. She's with me on the other side of this digital divide. Her name is Daphne Chiradotsi Droha. And I wanna thank you for joining me as part of this series, Ukraine Voices. And first, repeat your name so people hear it correctly in case I butchered it. Yeah, it's Daphne Chiadotsi Droha. Chiadotsi Droha. Now, you're yeah. part of this series. You referred to me from a, a fellow Ukrainian um, friend called yes. Ukrainian Voices, but your voice is definitely, you have a foot in the Ukraine, but you, there's a, a deeper in identity there for you as well. And that's, you're from, actually, you're from Nigeria. Is that correct? Yep, I'm Nigerian. You are Nigerian. And let's just get some facts going. I, I don't mean to be too, uh, too much like an interrogator, but just basically give me an overview of your journey from your home country to Ukraine to where you're sitting right now. Well, I, I still am a student in Ukraine, a student of international law. And I was also modeling in Ukraine. Uh, my journey from Nigeria to Ukraine is a very long story, but to put it shortly, mm -hmm. I was formerly in Russia also as a student. Okay. And then, like I mentioned earlier, I left for home uh, and I joined my sister to study in Ukraine. And that's where, that's not where my modeling career kicked off. It did kick off in Russia, but then I'd say... It was in Ukraine that I was older. I was I had way more experiences as that when I was modeling in Ukraine. So that's where I, I'd say the big part of my modeling took place. So you spent some time in Russia. You were in. Were you in Ukraine when this uh, the war began? Yes, yes. I spent some time in Russia. I speak Russian better than I speak Ukrainian. It's shameful, but mm -hmm. then it is what it is. And having been in both places, Ukraine and Russia, yes. how, how has that affected your reaction to this catastrophic war? I mean, how have you been able to process that? Well... I wasn't the only one that transferred from Russia to Ukraine. So I'd say first, when all the buzz was going on with going on um, about Ukraine invading Russia, sorry, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, when it was all on the news, we did not take it too seriously because we'd lived in Russia and we just always felt like Russia is a civilized nation, one. Two, uh, Russia and Ukraine have always had this back and forth. I remember a professor in school saying that uh, the, the thing going on between Russia and Ukraine is what goes on between siblings, how you have two siblings always fighting, but they'd always reconcile and it would never escalate. And it's just part of the relationship. So this is how it affected my view of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I just never took, plus I was going to work while everything was going on in the news. I was still, I had work, I had school. In Kiev, where I lived, everything was going on as usual. But then we would see on the news that uh, there was, there were Russian troops at the border and whatnot. And we felt it was some sort of media propaganda to cause panic. And then what happened happened and then found out that it wasn't just about that. It was, there was way more to it. And how long did you stay in Kiev before you were able to, to leave? It would have been three years by April 
what the war happened in February. So, oh, so you were there from February to April during the 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 height of the those battles. For... Oh no no no! I was there. I was there for maybe a week, precisely after I heard the first explosion go off. I was there for just one night. I'd say two days, two mornings, and after that, I left. I couldn't, I stayed in the bunker for just one night. And after that night, I found my way out, sort of. It was so chaotic, but I did find my way out. I didn't and, stay for long. And describe what that was like, just your, your way out. Uh, well, I, this is where um, the writer that I told you about comes in, because I feel like it just, as a writer, it's, I give more vivid descriptions when I read, when I've written something down. So yeah. I just read it if you're comfortable with that. Yeah. When you are, yeah. And I would want to preface that uh, is that you are a writer and I had an opportunity to read a few of your uh, short, short stories. And there is definitely, you know, a big talent there waiting to, to be heard. So yeah, you're welcome to describe in any way you can with your writing, uh, just what that experience was. So by all means. Yes, definitely. It took me so much time to call myself a writer because I just, I was just always writing and it was a very big part of my life. I did not see it as a title until I actually had to admit that there was something more to just being a scribbler. So I'd go on. Uh, and then if I get emotional while I'm reading, just go on with it because going back to the memories, they bring back very serious chills, but I, I, I feel like I'd be able to control myself, I hope. Uh, it's, a three part, it's a three part short piece. Okay. And this is the first part about my first, the morning when everything happened. There's a flood of memories from the days leading up to our escape from the Russian invasion. It's barely 5 a.m. in the morning. Mavi and I are sleeping when Yvonne runs into the room half naked, terrified. She's ordering us to jump out of bed, pack up and head for the elevator. I am still very sleepy. I try to pacify her, interrogate when an explosion goes off and shakes our apartment building. We live on the 19th floor of a 20-story building, almost 7.8 meters far from the foundation. And so, from the moment we scream, blood of Jesus, to the moment we find ourselves in the bunkers, I do not know what my life has become. Sunrise to sunset, the quietness of my dear Keith is infiltrated with air raid alarms, alerts, going off at every corner. Uh, yes, this is basically the first part. And I'd say it was after this day that I'd realized mm. we were in for big trouble. I don't even know what to say. Well, There, there, there actually isn't much to say. I, everything I have to say about my first, about the first part of the war, I said it there. I'd maybe just go on reading, reading it, and then probably with the third part, the last part of the short story, or the short piece uh, later on. It's day two, three, or four of our journey out to the border. I don't exactly remember. I lost count. We are all trying to doze off. The, the train rides slowly until it stops in the middle of nowhere. An announcement comes on and we shine our eyes in fear. The speaker is almost whispering. Vimknit usi plestroi, budjetihi, budlaska, mafchit, ini panikute. We've been instructed to stay quiet, not panic, and switch off all our devices. Something about this instruction sounds like a plea. The speaker starts off stern, but softens and begs, repeating what faithfully it almost sounds like a prayer. 
the woman in front of me follows suit. Ni, ni, ni plash. Good laska ni plash. No, no, don't cry, please. Don't cry. Many women join her. They instruct their babies to adhere. They pacify, soften, then beg. For the life of me, time has not known a more strenuous and bitter lengthening. Our train is finally night dark after what seems like a lifetime. Everybody and everything is still. Desert quiet, but for the cry of terrified children running out the windows into the empty streets, long withered from explosions and cold. Uh, the second part basically captures my journey leaving the second and the third part. And uh, I'd say that at the moment when this, this uh, scenes or this scene in particular happened, I was stuck in between fear and pity because we were in a loaded train, a packed train. It was, I was scared for my life. And by the way, I, I wasn't by myself. I moved or we moved in a group of six. So I sort of had people around me, but constantly we had to stop in, we had to stop in the middle of nowhere, so many nowheres, and we'd have to switch off our phones. We'd have to stay quiet, try not to move. We didn't ask questions, so I cannot exactly say why, but I'm guessing it's to keep us safe and ensure that there, was, there wasn't any maybe Russian troop in the corner. That's basically about that. And yeah, I just go ahead to the last part. Go ahead. Yes. A pale, lanky Ukrainian man, lips almost colorless, was asked to leave our cabinet with his small, tired looking backpack. He tried to explain that he was sick and couldn't stay back to fight. But security picked him up and let him out. You're sick? Okay, where's the doctor's reports? Just show us the doctor's reports. They clamored and clamored till our train took off. I held my gaze forward. I was too tired to break down again. Wasn't it just a few hours ago when my heart lapsed at the sight of a man crying profusely in the train? because he couldn't let go of his son's hands and the words insisted only the boy could board. And other men, tall, short, slim, bulk, stomping off in very fast and shaky steps, hiding their agony whenever they paused to look back and wave or blow firm kisses to their family. I held my gaze forward. Since I couldn't sleep, it was at least my duty to ensure that I could stay up and finish this journey with my sanity. There was no need catching visual memories capable of paralyzing me. And so I stayed stiff and looked ahead until lo and behold, me and my forward held coward gaze and met with few, I met few minutes to the border by an assemblage of stranded black foreigners. My skin collapses. Some of the faces are familiar and some are just terribly tortured, tired. Older men sit on the floor, shiver and hold blankets to their chests as the more youthful men struggle with the officials and threaten to pull down the walls of earth if they're not allowed a fighting chance to save themselves. How would you let them go before us? How would you let them in before us? The men bitterly chorus, they're dogs, they're dogs. Some human beings are dying from cold and you put dogs before us. Dogs, 
what the fuck? Sorry, I cursed, but it's part of the right up. Yes, this is basically about it. Um, when I when I was done reading or writing this piece, I had I had some of my friends around, my sister and a couple of the people I traveled with. I was sampling their opinions, and I mentioned something that I think is still very striking to me, which is that uh, I titled the war the result, and I said that uh, very few things are usually about the the result. War is not just about war. War is about gender. War is about race. War is about is about abuse of power. War is about very it's about things that ideally and not only do not only make up the story of bombs and explosions. I mentioned this because uh, prior to writing this uh, three-part story, I was so, I'd seen so many things and I'd felt so many things. I did not know exactly what to write about. And to be honest, I was skeptical. I did not know if to mention the last part that I just read about what I saw was going on with some of the black men uh, and later on women. I wasn't sure if I should include it because I was very privileged. I, it didn't happen to me. I was very privileged because I was a mother in Ukraine. I had so many people volunteer to take me out. I had so many people recommend routes to me, Ukrainians. So I felt some sort of gratitude that made me initially just feel like the war wasn't about me, it wasn't about any person of color. The war was about Ukrainians, people that actually, uh, in the original sense, if I should put it that way, had just lost their homes. So I did not know if to write about the last part that I included. But like I said, it was after telling myself genuinely that war isn't about just one thing. War can never be just about even the things that I experienced myself. So I got serious comfortability speaking about it because it's the whole story and I cannot bring myself to tell the story without telling that part. Because especially I was privileged, like I said, I knew so many Ukrainians, I had so many Ukrainians as friends. So I saw the war through their eyes a whole lot, to a very great extent, if I should put it that way. And until I saw what was happening that day, or until I witnessed what I witnessed, I didn't even realize that there was going to be any racism card if I should put it that way. But yeah, that's that's about it. Hopefully you understood everything I read and I was- I did, I did. And it, of course it exposes, um, you know, we, in America, we, we've come through this incredible, you know, the, the, the struggle of, of racism in the United States is, you know, very often on, you know, on my, on my mind and in my face, but we don't hear about, how war and conflict and poverty exposes those issues in other parts of the world, specifically in your case, Ukraine. And your little yeah. anecdote offered a very um, kind of some insight into that, you know, in a way that um, most people don't really think about. So I appreciate it and your story. Yeah. So, that took you to, to what the Polish border and now you're in Rotterdam. Have you been able to reestablish the flow of your education and your modeling career in, in Europe? Uh, like I said, I have come to recognize until the war happened, I did not even know it was a thing, but I have come to recognize very serious privilege. It's also what makes, what made me skeptical uh, about, uh, skeptical I, I didn't know if i should talk about the racism card or not because like i said 
I wasn't sure if the whole thing, I wasn't, I, I tried my best not to make it about me. I tried my best not to make it about me or the people that I felt like, I tried not to, to be plain, I tried not to make it about me or people of color, foreigners. I tried to make it about the people that I felt were the centerpiece of the war. Uh, I'm mentioning that because since moving here, I've lived in three different countries and I've gotten so many recommendations uh, from Ukrainian friends. I was, I was introduced to you by a Ukrainian friend. I've right. gotten recommendations on how to get back, uh, how to get back on my modern career. Uh, I have a meeting in, uh, I have a meeting sometime in June with some of the people that I worked with in Ukraine. So about my modeling, it's right now, it's not the first, it's not a priority on my list. I'm trying, I'm still going to school online. I'm trying to fix my accommodation. I'm trying to fix getting an actual, I wouldn't call it nine to five, but a student job and so many other things. I left Germany where I initially was with family, my brother and his family. Uh, and I moved to Netherlands. So far, it's been both good and bad. Somehow, I always find that I have a bad experience with getting something, but people have it worse. So I guess I'm just grateful. Well, it's it takes some wisdom to recognize your own privilege in this world sometimes, and, and you've been able to to do that. And you're studying also for the law. Now, you, were, you originally were studying to be a doctor in Russia. And in the intervening period, you had this interesting modeling career. And now you but there's a the larger academic goal is to to become an international lawyer. Is that right? Yes, I always wanted to be a doctor. I was so sure. Uh huh. I was in medical school with my sister. And I had a phase where I realized that if I wasn't in the arts, I probably wouldn't be mentally stable. So I left and I went back home to my parents that surprisingly supported me. And yes, I, after being in Nigeria for a couple of years, I moved to Ukraine to study international law. And how's that going? That's going great. I always say it's... It's one of the best decisions I made because I, I, funny enough, I didn't even make the decision myself. It was my sister who called home and said, she's coming back. I can't, I can't continue doing, seeing her like this. It was such a dramatic phase, I right? so sensitive. But then, yes, I had a little depression phase and I went back home because like I said, I always wanted to be a medical student. So I couldn't, it wasn't a case of, I didn't want to do this. I was so confused, but I'd say that, especially because I'd stopped writing, uh, I did not recognize myself. I did not understand what was going on in my life. So now I'm looking forward to be, to being an international lawyer. And oh, writer. And, and writer. writer. And writer, and writer. And you join a proud Nigerian literary tradition and as tragic as this experience has been for Ukraine and the world, it's for a writer to live through something so cataclysmic, it is in a way a gift to bear witness. Uh, and how you process that as a writer is a very important challenge going forward, right? Yes, yes, definitely. I've had so many people say, oh, Daphne, you should write a book. You should do this. You should do that. And maybe the anecdote I read is closest to almost everything I can do because writing it, talking about it, it's so sensitive. It's so sensitive. I can barely even write about the Biafran war that happened in Nigeria many years ago that I did not experience myself. This is way, it's way, out, of, way out of board, way out of line for me. Now, Nigeria has had this rich and uh, difficult colonial history and struggle against colonial powers. And whether it was the British or 
before that, you know, slavers just, Absolutely. and when you look at this U Russian Ukrainian relationship, it, it does feel like this is a, almost a Russian effort to reestablish a kind of colonial <laughs> control over what they believe to be, or Putin at least believes to be part of, you know, mother Russia. I don't know if that something you were able to draw anything from, from those kind of comparisons. Uh, can you repeat yourself? Say that again. I said, can you repeat yourself? Well, Nigeria has this history of a struggle against colonial oppression. Yes. Very vivid. And this war between Russia and Ukraine, there is a colonial sort of echo there between Russia trying to establish its iron fist over what they believe to be part of larger mother Russia, when in fact, there's a very different and powerful cultural identity going on there. Yes. Like I said, I, I totally understand what you're seeing. The, before Ukraine gained its independence, uh, Ukraine was part of former Soviet Union, the USSR. Correct. So Ukraine, uh, it's, it even shows in the fact that, like I said, I speak Russian. So many people in the capital city of Ukraine speak Russian. Uh, so it looked, still looks so much, even if Russia is known to a very good extent to be just that bad guy. It looked so much like bullying to me. That's why I said it looks so much like abuse of power. It looks so much like something that I recognize. And that's why I said that uh, the war, what's, what's usually, when you say war, what comes to people's minds before you experience it is their explosions. Uh, this country has sent a couple of, this country has sent troops and uh, they're like ammo tanks, but, Genuinely, not just genuinely, but in details, there is rape, there's gender conversations, conversations about bullying, conversations about betrayal, because funny enough, there are, of course, there are insiders in Ukraine, Russian insiders in Ukraine. Right. So it's something that I recognize both as Nigerian and there's someone that really just experienced the war and analyzed it in class so many times. I saw that it wasn't really about the fact that Russia is powerful. It's, it had so much to do with very little things, propaganda, right. drama. The uniqueness of your own experience coming from Nigeria by way of Russia, the pursuit of a medical career and then then you're changing your mind and becoming a model or the modeling is going on at the same time and then you come to ukraine and you decide you want to pursue a career as an international lawyer and now this war it's offered you very just an incredibly unique journey and i always say the more personal the journey the more universal so your individual journey which differs in in many ways from most of the other Ukrainian people that I've spoken to, it's still, there's a universal truth to your personal story. So <clears throat> I find that as illuminating as, as anything, especially, you know, the kind of racial insights that you offered in your short story there that you related. So to me, it's very compelling. And as you look forward to, um, uh, you were just describing to me basically the, the kind of the picture that I was was trying to get was what your life in Nigeria was like before you even left. And you, you mentioned you're going to boarding schools and family life. And I was I was going to boarding school and um, prior to what happened, prior to the insurgents, I'd say the only personal experience I've had with war and yeah the only personal experience i've had with war is like i said the biafran war mm -hmm. the civil war in nigeria but i'd only heard stories but very personal stories however another reason why i'd say that even as an international law student i was still put in Ukraine after, in Kyiv, yeah, after all the drama was going on in the news, 
is because I don't know if you know it, but almost everywhere I go to, the first every time, almost every time I travel and I say I'm Nigerian, the first thing most people ask about is the Boko Haram insurgents in the northern part of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it happens to be that if you live in Nigeria, when you hear the news or when you leave Nigeria and you hear Boko Haram described by foreigners, described in the news, it's totally different from what I experience is living in other states in Nigeria. Not to, not to, um, of course, not to make irrelevant the the dramatic and very, very negative impact of the terrorism group. But if you're not, if you don't live in the northern part of Nigeria, you most likely would not have any personal experience of Boko Haram. And prior to the outbreak between Ukraine and Russia, there was always some sort of um, threat of uh, threat of force between Russia and Ukraine. The Donbas region was, even before I became a student, the Donbas region in Ukraine, it was invaded by Russia. Crimea was annexed by Russia. Uh, so many of all these things were going on. I think even in 2014, I cannot remember, Mar not Maripol, I can remember the name of the city, but it was also, it was also attacked by Russia. So when we heard that Russian troops were at the border, we thought they were coming for one other small city or they were trying to make another dramatic, trying to make another dramatic entrance into a part of Ukraine that they felt originally belonged to Russia. Nobody saw an outbreak of war. So yes, that's that's how I can relate the my state of mind when the war started off in Ukraine and how it is in Nigeria. Being Nigerian, I was so comfortable. I was like, we figure it we are around it. Plus, if it's on the news, just because it's on the news and there's a buzz, it doesn't mean it's actually going to affect you, especially if you leave maybe in the capital or if you leave a little far from where it's happening. So if you don't see it, it's not there, was sort of the mindset. Sort of, sort of. I, we, do, we know how bad, it, how bad it gets being in Ukraine, but then I have work, I have school. I can't just basically, basically my whole life, my whole life was centered in Kyiv, so I could not leave Ukraine because I heard or because I was suspecting that some other city far away was going to get in trouble or was going to get in a bad situation with Russia. And like I said, um, this is not to this is not to downplay what actually happens, both with the Boko Haram situation and with the situation of annexing Crimea. It's not to downplay that, but I cannot say that I'd seen it or that I had someone, I just heard about it in school. I'd heard about it reading the news. I'd heard about it from our professors. Everybody knows that Crimea was annexed. So it's that sort of thing. Right. Well, I mean, Russia fought a war called the Crimean War in the 1840s for the for Sebastopol and uh, those uh, very same that very same piece of uh, earth. They they fought wars prior to that. Um, well, Daphne, definitely your journey is a, a unique one. What's 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 your summer look like? Is it school? Is it modeling? Uh, where can people see you or find you or read about you or more importantly, read your your uh, important literary offerings. I want to give the world a chance to find out about Daphne. Uh, mostly on Instagram. I, I usually say Instagram is my portfolio because okay. that's where I have everything going on. I'm trying to also 
move a little to Facebook because I seem to have a very good audience there that I've been taking for granted. But yes, Daphne Duroha on Instagram, that's where I do most of my social stuff. And what my summer is looking like is modeling. I have I have a summer break, summer vacation from school. And I'm, I'm in the Netherlands now. I uh, Even if I'd be traveling to Germany very soon, I'm sort of in the citadel of international law because right here in Den Haag, there's the International okay. Criminal Courts, ICJ. So hopefully I'd also be doing something useful and impactful for the global community while I'm here as, as a diplomat to be. And like I say, there's no season for my writing. So summer, winter, every time writing is always in the picture. Yes. Well, The Hague and has of course been the international uh, location where all these war crimes have been arbitrated over the last um, decades. Yep. So it's quite conceivable that uh, war crimes will be prosecuted, hopefully in the near future. And that the catastrophe that is in Ukraine will find a, a, a hopeful outcome. I don't know what it will be. Uh, it will definitely feeling... be victory. What's that? I said, fingers crossed, it definitely be victory. I'd love to see that happen. Right. I would like to see reparations paid, the borders restored, a regime definitely. change in Russia for the benefit of Russian people. Uh, and the whole world, to be what, honest. What's that? <laughs> For the benefit of Russian people and the whole world. The whole world. And yeah. it's, it's been instructive in a way to see how, well, this is sort of the existential question that I've asked myself, is how much of this is an expression of one person's malevolence? And how much of it is an expression of a cultural, political, racial, whatever problem you want to call, between you know for russia and i don't know the answer to that <sighs> i also cannot give a precise uh answer but then i think a huge part of it like we said because uh ukraine and russia have this not colonial sort of they have the ussr that happened before this time so to a very good extent, especially after hearing that, or after we all expected the whole world to step in and stop and close the skies and whatnot. I think there's just the balance between both. Ukraine seemed like an easy target for Russia because of the colonial history. Uh, so a whole lot of it has to do with that fact, but then also has to do with the fact that Russia is a very powerful country and other powerful countries are obviously supporting, but I mean, it's just Ukraine in the war right now. Right. Well, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to go back there under more peaceful times. And I would like to visit Ukraine and this is the telling these stories, Ukraine voices oh. is the, the least I can do from my vantage point here in my little uh, uh, apartment here in Hollywood to, to just help tell these stories and you know, do, do whatever I can from, from where I sit. And I, I really appreciate Daphne, you're joining me and um, you are very enchanting you know, on the outside and obviously on the inside, there's a incredibly uh, attractive package inside and out there that uh, I'm sure the world or whoever sees us, you know, will, will for sure, for sure take notice of. I just want to thank you for joining me. And um, thank you for joining me. yeah, is there anything else you'd like to add or share before we say goodbye? Uh, I was going to add that if you when things get better hopefully very soon when you come to visit ukraine i'm going to be your tour guide 
because I have a totally, I have a different eye for Ukraine. I like to say that. So I take it to Odessa. I take it, I had so many plans for the summer. Ukraine is like my home. So I would be your tour guide because even if you have some other person to, to take you around, I feel like if you see Ukraine through my eyes, it would be it's really beautiful and i just like to share that with anybody that wants to well i i'm i want to get there and i want the tour i mean wherever i sign up you and i are now we are connected and friends so definitely, uh, definitely. I, as a matter of fact i even friend requested you on facebook today so <laughs> just today just today because i gotta travel check but yes um you know there's a, a saying you know uh, next year in jerusalem you know amongst uh Jews, and let's just say next year in Kiev. Definitely. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. And I, like I was saying before the before we started off, I love what you're doing. It's I I love everything about it. The arts, the topic about race, everything. It's just I'm very very interested in humanity. So inherently, I'm also interested in justice. Interested in little little things and i just felt very well i'm i'm very moved that you would say that and as a as a final thought i would say that justice and peace are two links and we understand just as humans what's fair and what's not and the laws are just a way to kind of codify that but we all understand what's fair and what's not and when things are fair we have generally we have peace in this world and when things aren't you know that's just that's just the way it flows from the sandbox in kindergarten to the uh, european capitals so that's my final thought i just want to thank you again daphne for this conversation you can stay on after i hit end and we can have a little final chat but to, with, but to everybody else out there, I want to thank you for joining Rebel Without Applause. Till next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that, I mean, yeah, you know, namaste, shalom.